Hey guys, welcome. Today is Friday, January 26th. We're doing chapter 11 of Book Club Unlearn Your Pain by Dr. Schubiner. And we just have one more chapter left after this. And this chapter is a little bit shorter. So we will have some time for questions, for coaching. And next week is a Q&A chapter. So it uh, goes over like the frequently asked questions there too. So I'm going to go ahead. I do have a little, uh, uh, some slides to share from the chapter. And then we'll go to questions. And of course, if you have anything to add in the chat, feel free to do that as well. All right. Oops, just got out of screen share. Why did I do that? <laughs> Let me get the chat. Okay, sorry, just this little part at the beginning where I figure everything out and admit people. Okay, so chapter 11 is charting your future. And he has it kind of divided into two sections. You might still feel like you're in the first section for those yet to complete their recovery. So maybe you have noticed some changes or maybe you haven't noticed any changes yet, even if you've done this program. So remember just to help remind your brain, um, it doesn't always happen quickly for everyone. Some people have had pain pathways that have developed over a long time and it may take a while to overcome them. It doesn't necessarily mean the longer you've had it, the longer it will take, but if it is taking a while, just being compassionate with yourself about how long it's taking, because if you've you know, had years or decades of neural pathways forming, um, you know, it, it could take some time to rewire, like being patient, like you're training a puppy. So there are a few different references. I tried to include all the references he's talking about here. Um, there's this thank you, Dr. Sarno and TMS Wiki, where you could read stories of other people who have recovered that could be inspirational. And one of the most important and common barriers to getting better is the persistent belief that there's something physically wrong with your body. So maybe believing like the doctors have missed something. If the pain is this bad, it must be something structural, um, you know, just not really believing that it's mind body. So if you're not sure that you have MBS, you could seek out doctors who can carefully review your situation, your exam, and your testing. He lists some websites where there are doctors that know about this approach. And he even suggests that maybe you could have your doctor read the first few chapters of this book. But just seeking out any doctor might be confusing, right? Because they might not know about this approach. And then you could, you know, have them tell you something that is <clears throat> contrary to what you're learning here. So trying to get a doctor that knows about this would be helpful. <clears throat> and I even know that Dr. Schubiner will do some, uh, some online consultations, I think. And, and I also know of people who've emailed him and gotten responses from him. So the other thing is if you are confident that you do have mind-body syndrome, an option is to start this book over to do this program again. But if you're a perfectionist, it might not be a good idea to restart the program from the beginning. It would be best to take a break from the structured program for a while and follow the rest of the advice in this section. So this chapter is probably one that could be frustrating for some people because we like to just have set things that we're told to do and this is what you do and you'll get better. But in this chapter, it's kind of like, you could try, you know, going over it again, or you could totally take a break from it. And depending on what's going on for you, one of those might be better than the other. <clears throat> so really starting to lean into how you're feeling. And if you have those perfectionistic tendencies and you're really urgent, then um, going back through it with this urgency could actually be preventing you from getting better. Another suggestion is to just pick and choose the exercises that you'd like to complete over the next few weeks. So not necessarily like I'll go back starting at the very beginning of the book and doing every single exercise perfectly, but like, you know, it, I'm kind of drawn to those letters, those unsent letters. So I'll do a few more of those this week or something like that. So notice that this is just a very individualized program. There's no one size fits all for everyone. So look for 
things that particularly resonate with you that you find helpful. You could review chapters nine and 10 to determine specific barriers to getting better that you may have missed. So do you remember when we talked about those barriers to getting better? Um, there might be some hidden parts of you that prefer not to get better. And this is not that you're you know, being manipulative or trying to fake it, but just when your nervous system and brain have been used to a certain way of life for a while, um, it may be hard to change some of those things at a subconscious level because, you know, maybe there are some ways you feel like it benefits you. Maybe as a child, you only got attention when you were sick. And so, you know, subconsciously, there's this belief that if I get better, then I won't get the care and attention that I need, things like that. So that's in chapters nine and 10. And then it's frequently necessary to do something actively to resolve emotional issues. So he talks about like, you know, you might be writing an unsent letter to someone, but you're in that situation with that person day to day. And, and maybe you actually need to have a conversation with that person. So if it's someone that's not in your life anymore, maybe they've passed on, don't think, oh, well, I'll never be able to resolve it because you know, I'm not able to, because that person isn't on the earth anymore. That's where those letters and things could be helpful. But especially he gives a couple of, of examples of kind of like real life situations where that person is still in their life and just writing the letter wasn't sufficient, but actually having a conversation with that person was. So again, it's like really feel into what feels like it would be most helpful for you. Sometimes people have a conversation with someone and it, you know, they have a certain expectation, the person will apologize and they don't, and then they leave feeling frustrated too. So it's not like any one of these things is the definite cure, but it, they're all things to consider if you're struggling. So on the other hand, if you've already dealt with and processed the stressful and emotional situations in your life, it can be important to stop looking in that direction for your recovery. So I've seen this where some people you know, they just think because I keep having pain, it means that I must have missed something. You know, there's some subconscious emotions that I need to keep looking for, or there's some resolution that I need to keep finding. And that, again, that urgency to try to fix that and to try to find this one solution is actually keeping them in pain. So sometimes it's better to stop um, like ruminating and perseverating about like these unknown psychological things that might be going on and start doing other things to live your life. <clears throat> so one of the biggest barriers to getting better is anxiety and fear. That's just universally true, right? Like we know there's the pain fear cycle. So if you have a symptom and you add fear and anxiety to it, your brain amplifies the production of that pain or symptom. So you must be able to accept that pain occurs and not panic when it does. You must learn to relax and have confidence that your pain will go away. Know that you're healthy and on the right path. So this is a process, but it's so, so important. Work to banish worry, fear, and anxiety by using the same techniques as pain. So we can treat those emotions the same way we treat pain. Like this is just misinformation from the brain. You could write to the worry or talk to the fear or meditate on the anxiety. So all of those same uh, strategies, techniques that we're using for pain reprocessing, you can use it for anxiety and fear as well. So important. <clears throat> And then start to do as many of the activities as you can do. The more active you are, the quicker you'll retrain your brain and develop new non-pain -pain pathways. So, you know, of course, if you're having a lot of fear and you have a ton of pain, start slow. There's, you know, those graded exposure ways of introducing yourself. But generally, when we have pain, we tend to avoid doing activities so that we avoid the pain. And one of the best ways to teach your brain it's safe is to actually do those activities. And then I love this because one of my main things that I love teaching about is like we need to add self-care and fun 
back into our lives. So it's not just like getting rid of these symptoms, but actually also increasing the amount of pleasure and fun and joy that we're having in our lives. So he says, find time for activities for yourself, a minimum of four to five hours per week on fun and pleasurable activities. And he says, if you're the kind of person that is finding a really hard time doing this, it's probably more important for you to do it, right? Because those kind of people that have that strong sense of duty and obligation and they're perfectionists and feel like they need to be producing and doing things all the time, they're the people that most need fun activities and self-care. So mindfulness, Dr. Schubiner taught mindfulness meditation. I think he said it or practiced it for years. So he gives some references for mindfulness meditations. The Mindfulness Solution is a book, and then it has a corresponding website with free meditations on it. He also suggests Byron Katie. She has that book, Loving What Is, as, as well as a few other resources. And her website is thework.org. And that can be really, really helpful for you know, those things that have happened in the past that you can't change, um, you know, reframing so that you're not blaming yourself, especially a lot of people who've suffered abuse tend to still hold on to some kind of belief that they deserved it. And Byron Katie has a real, sometimes people don't like the way that she um, reframes things, but it really can help move people out of that um, more victim position to one of peace and maybe even power. The mindful path to self-compassion and the love response and self-compassion, stop beating yourself up and leave insecurity behind. Those are all books about self-compassion, which can be super helpful if you're feeling like that's an area where you need a little more support. Um, again, the this is a huge area for most people that, that I've come in contact with and myself. Um, because part of mind body syndrome is we tend to be really hard on ourselves and critical, and we've probably learned to relate to ourselves that way, kind of beating ourselves up when things aren't going well. So, um, definitely look into the self-compassion if that's calling to you. And he also says hypnosis and imagery can be helpful. And there's a website for that. And then there's this position of power where you stand and put your hands on your hips and it actually just even a few seconds of standing with your posture upright and having your hands on your hips actually increases your testosterone levels. People who did that before an interview did better on their interviews. So even just things like changing your posture, things like yoga, tai chi, qigong and focusing are ways of training your body into movement that's like more of a mind body approach and can feel more safe to your body and then he also says you can look into getting counseling yeah mary says well, wonder woman stance exactly um so a psychologist counselor life coach that has been trained in these methods can be super helpful. There are lists, the ppdaassociation.com or org, tmswiki.org, painreprocessingtherapy.com. There are so many people getting certified in these methods that are listed as resources there. And sometimes people are like, well, there's no one in my area, but you can do, I do all of my visits over Zoom. So there are a few people in Utah that you know, I'm, I probably live 30 minutes from, but I don't do in-person sessions. We do it over Zoom. So even if you're in a remote area where there's no practitioners, um, the, that's the beautiful thing about the internet is you can connect with people who are outside of your area and still get the resources that way. Okay. And then he has a few other ideas of complementary therapies things for trauma healing and processing. The ISTDP is what he talks about that he bases the emotional EAEDP or what is it? Anyway, the it's, it's more about the emotional processing and there are some practitioners there. Um, Somatic experiencing by Peter Levine. I really love him. I've done a retreat with him. 
Um, so ex somatic experiencing could be an option that you look into. There's a website for that. Sensory motor integration by Pat Ogden, EMDR, um, that's also recommended, and EFT, that's the tapping, emotional freedom technique. I've liked that. There's an app for that that I like. And internal family systems, he talks a little bit about in that chapter nine. And so if that's calling to you, I know there's a book called No Bad Parts that I need to still read, but I've heard that's really good. And I think he references it earlier when he talks about internal family systems. So like I said about this chapter, like I anticipate that for some people it's it's great to hear all these resources and for other people it can be frustrating because we want to just know, well, what's going to work for me? So really just like taking in all this information and then starting to listen to your intuition and what you're drawn to and what you think might help most for you because you're really going to know better than some other expert who doesn't know you personally. So starting to trust that. So he has a quote from someone who has recovered, and this is a perspective that some people get to. Um, Strange as it may sound, I'm thankful for my experience with mind-body syndrome. Without the incentive from what that wretched from that wretched pain, I never would have looked inside myself for the answers. In doing so, I was forced to confront old demons and begin the path towards healing, both inside and out. So I like this idea that. You know, for me, I definitely feel that like in a way, you know, not to just gloss over and just be like, you know, I love that I had that. But at the same time, those symptoms that I had prompted me to change my life in a lot of very, very healthy ways and even change some, you know, intergenerational patterns that now you know, I can change for my kids. And if I didn't know about this approach, I would probably still just be like feeling sick and taking medicine and feeling hopeless. But because of this, it taught me to go deeper into my personal issues, the, the ways I was being so hard on myself, my perfectionism, and change those things so that not only did it help my health, but just my well-being in life. So I've heard it said like, this can be the the entry point for some people is their pain and for other people it might be something else right some um other life event or they just get so fed up they go to therapy or whatever so it it really is prompting you to make some lifestyle changes and not just like i'm doing this just to get rid of pain it's like i want to have more of a regulated nervous system overall and less stress and start to really live my life. And, and that can help you with this. And then Mary says, yeah, I like there are different resources because we don't all learn the same. Yeah, exactly. And, and me personally, I also find that I go through phases where like I did tapping for a while and I was doing it every day. And then um, before that I did meditation and journaling. And so also just being aware that like, it doesn't have to be like, this is the one thing that, that works for me. And that will always work. It's like, you're constantly evolving and changing. And so just being open to, I like the thought I've offered in another, um, in another time, another book club of like, the right resources come to me at the right time, because it can feel overwhelming and I know I, when I started this process, I was like, there's so many books to read, so many podcasts to listen to and felt very overwhelmed by it, but just kind of trusting your instincts that like, if I'm really drawn to this approach, this is the right one for me at this time. And although there's a ton of information out there, I'm kind of more drawn to the things that will help me at this time. Like I sometimes would go to play a podcast that wouldn't play. And then I play something else and I'm like, that's exactly what I needed to hear. So kind of trusting that process of like, things are working out for me and I'm getting the information and I'm drawn to the people and the information and the resources that will help me most at this time. And then more information will come to me as I'm ready for that. That's just a belief I like. Okay, so these are key aspects of the treatment of mind-body syndrome. So it's kind of like a summary and review. So number one, education about what mind-body syndrome is and how it works. So if you're still kind of in that area, then 
getting to those fit criteria and going through the workbook where it talks about, you know, do I even have mind body syndrome? That could be the area you focus on. Accepting the diagnosis on both an intellectual level as well as a gut level, learning new ways of interacting with your pain, which break the pain, fear, pain cycle. So reacting to it differently, understanding how certain personality traits can not only be beneficial, but also self-destructive when taken to extremes and turned on the self. Um, that, that for me was one of the biggest ones was the personality traits. Learning to recognize experience and process emotions, learning to think psychologically instead of physically when pain arises, like my arms just started hurting again. What's going on inside emotional right now, emotionally right now? <clears throat> yeah, I always say like one of the biggest things that we do as humans when we have a symptom is like, what did I just last do? And we make a um, our brain starts forming a belief about that. Oh, it was the activity that caused it, or it was the food that I ate that caused it. And for me, digestion sy symptoms, you know, it's really easy to think like my stomach hurts. So what was the food that just caused it? But now when my stomach hurts at least nine times out of 10, I think, um, what, you know, is emotionally going on. And then even if I go to like what food it is, I was like, oh yeah, wait, it's probably the stress. It's not the food. Uh, learning to stand up for yourself with confidence and self-compassion in the face of life's inevitable stressors. So sometimes we might do all the emotional processing and stuff, but we're not standing up for ourselves and we'll, we're still being a people pleaser and we're still, um, you know, feeling like a victim in things. So learning to stand up for yourself can be one of those hard lessons, drawing some boundaries, but so, so important to getting better. And learning to let go of fears and turn towards acceptance and joy in one life in one's life. So we've talked about that, just kind of a review. And then he has this section about once you have recovered. So maybe you are one of the blessed ones, the lucky ones, the happy ones that by the course of you know doing these exercises, you feel like your chronic pain has decreased or gone. And this is still, it's not like you're, you know, you do it once in your life, you never have a symptom again. You may want to keep working and learning about yourself. Because remember, Dr. Schubiner says he even still gets mind body symptoms and, and I for sure still do. So um, it's very common that you're a human and you have a stressful life situation and you're the kind of human that tends to express things through their body a little bit more. So just realizing like, you know, it's always just going to be this indicator of stress. And it's actually a sign that I'm evolving and changing when I have like new stressors like that in my life. So you could continue some of the exercises from this book, whether keeping a diary, writing unsent letters or dialogues or meditating regularly. So I feel like some people like, you know, you kind of fall into some of those things that are working for you. But, you know, instead of just thinking like, okay, I've cured it, I never need to ever like, process emotions or meditate again, just realize this is a lifestyle change. That's an ongoing thing. Use the affirmations, continue to remind yourself that you're healthy, strong, and able to withstand stressful events. And you may still get symptoms since your body serves as a built-in alarm system. It will alert you when things are occurring in your life that are troubling, even if you're not aware that you're upset. This is when I hear all the time. And sometimes even with coaching, like we get 30 minutes in after someone has said, there's nothing stressful in my life. And then they're like, oh yeah, you know, my mom's going in for surgery and I'm her main caregiver and I still have resentment towards my mom. I guess maybe that, you know, like it's like weird how our brain kind of even blocks things out that are stressful that we're just like, no, I'm not stressed. And then there is a big stressor there. So just because in your conscious mind, you don't uh, like know or realize what the stressors are. Remember our conscious mind it's like, what is it? The, the subconscious process is like 11 billion pieces of information, bits of information per second. And the conscious mind processes 40 per second. I think those are the numbers. Don't quote me exactly, but it's something like billions going on in the subconscious. And our conscious mind is, is just only aware of a very small percentage of it. So you can actually use your body as that indicator of like, hmm, maybe I am stressed about something or more stressed than I think. And remember, 
I keep quoting this because I love how he says like, it doesn't have to be a big thing. It could be looking for a parking place, running late, concern about a child, fearing a difficult conversation. I had that just the other day where I knew I had to have a difficult conversation with someone and I was feeling so like fatigued and just like depressed. And, and I was like, oh, I think it's because I don't want to, you know, I, I like to avoid rather than confront someone in a difficult conversation. So it could be a little thing that triggers symptoms, totally normal. If you do get new symptoms, you may need to see a doctor. Definitely um, at some point you may want to rule out that something structural is not going on. But since you understand mind-body syndrome, you'll want to look for issues in your life as a cause for new symptoms. Often it's easy to identify them when you take a few minutes to think. And if you can't, you know, cognitively think of it, just writing stuff down, just start free writing, free association journaling. And usually then I start to come up with like, oh, maybe that is a little more stressful than I was thinking. The quicker you identify MBS, you can stop symptoms from taking hold. I definitely have some examples of that with like tooth and facial pain that only lasted for a day with um, some hip pain that came up that only lasted for a couple of days. And so um, if you're in that, tell me about your pain Facebook group, we have to tell you to, you know, check it out with a doctor and because we're not going to diagnose you because of one paragraph online, right? But at the same time, if you're in this group, you're the kind of person that expresses things through your body. And the more you can start to believe this is probably mind body, this is probably mind body, and it goes away within a few days, then, then you know. But if you're like, oh my gosh, I wonder if this is a real problem, that fear can amplify it, keep it going for several days, weeks, months. And then, um, and then if you go to the doctor quickly, sometimes that can amplify your fear too. So again, I'm not going to tell you not to get medical advice. If you do have a doctor that's familiar with this approach, that would be ideal, but just know that, um, you know, Dr. Schubner's advice is to, to go the mind body approach first before you just go to the doctor for every new symptom, especially if you're in that symptom imperative time, it's normal for your body to start creating new symptoms. Um, so just think about that. All right. And then you may want to help others. A lot of times when you've recovered and you've had success, you look at all your, your friends and family that are struggling and you're like, oh, I want to share this with them, right? I want them to feel as good as I do. So be forewarned. Most people you tell about this will not be interested or they'll refuse to think that their condition could be mind-body syndrome. So I've I've been pleasantly surprised, even doctors that I've talked to about you know, I think that stress is making my symptoms worse. And, and they're like, yeah, that, that makes sense. So usually that's the approach that I take is like, you know, most people understand that when they're stressed, their symptoms are worse, but sometimes I don't go into the whole expl explanation of like repressed emotions and blah, blah, you know? So I would just say, if you're feeling that desire to share, you know, you can always plant some seeds and, I've actually been pleasantly surprised that more people are open to it than I thought. Um, but if if they're not open to it, it doesn't mean you're wrong and it doesn't mean um, they'll never be open to it. Maybe they just need to hear it a few times or they need a few more years before they're ready for that approach. And he does say, if there were fewer stigmas attached to the idea that the mind can cause real pain and other symptoms, more people would get the kind of help they really need rather than receiving medical testing and treatment that is ineffective or even harmful and expensive, right? So many times people are paying thousands of dollars for treatments that are not even working. So healthcare costs would be declined by eliminating unnecessary testing and treatments. So that, that is all we have for our slides. So we have a lot of time um, for your guys' comments, questions. If you have su success stories you want to share, that's always fun to hear your wins. 
Um, but I just want to turn the time over to you guys. If you, let's see, you can probably let's see all of a sudden it looked like, okay. Um, you can raise your hand if you go onto that reactions and there's a hand raising. I don't see anyone with their hand raised. Or if you can't figure that out, just unmute yourself and you don't have to hear me just talking the whole time. Let's go to you guys. Or we could end early, but I'm assuming there might be like some people that want to share or ask something. What do you think? PJ, hey, thanks for volunteering. Getting an awkward silence there for a minute. <laughs> What's on your mind? Um, it's just a question about choosing among all these different options of what to do when your your pains come back mm. and also you know kind of like would it really make sense to to try to work with somebody one-on-one -on -one or try to do it myself I mean having resolved problems in the past mm -hmm. but then my curable group ended mm. And then I've been kind of on my own. Mm -hmm. So I hadn't really been doing things, but then symptoms started up again. Mm. So yeah, sort of my dilemma at the moment. Okay. And if you just had to, you know, kind of ask yourself and answer that question of like, what do you think is going on for you with those symptoms coming back? What would your guess be if you had to guess? I, you know, I, I guess probably some, some elements of my life really haven't changed much. So some of the stresses mm. that were there before are still there mm. mm -hmm. and they haven't really been resolved. So, okay. Yeah. Probably when I had, was in this curable group earlier, you know, it was like every week I had sort of an assignment of stuff to read, stuff to think about met with the group for a couple of hours to talk about it mm -hmm. so that was a nice outlet mm. but yeah okay and with those stressors like uh what is the main like emotion created by those stressors um I guess it's anxiety you know kind of like yeah yeah that makes sense what what do I want to do with the rest of my life? Yeah. Um, I, I'm semi-retired now. I do a little bit of consulting work, but not much. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of like, how do I want to spend my life? How do I want to spend my days? Mm. You know, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And definitely anxiety is one of the most common things that drives our symptoms, right? Because it's one of those fearful emotions and that is that activating the amygdala, the primitive brain, and that's where we produce pain as well. So um, yeah, definitely thinking of like specifically what kinds of things have helped before and how it's helped. Like, what do you think about, um, you know, it sounds like the group approach and having so uh, some place to meet and having assignments was helpful for you because it's like maybe more structure. Yeah, having more structure and some accountability. And helped, accountability. Um, yeah. And I mean, prior to doing the curable group, I tried all kinds of different things, you know, physical therapy, massage mm -hmm. therapy, acupuncture, um, movement therapy, all these things to deal with the frozen shoulder. Mm. And I didn't really get, it didn't really go away mm -hmm. until I went through this 12 week curable group. Mm -hmm. So that's and nice. Then, then afterwards, now I have problems with the opposite shoulder. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So definitely um, like with your case, 
you've seen some results with one of the approaches that you tried and it was that group and having accountability. So that's a nice thing to remember of like, okay, this type of thing did help me before. And so chances are, you know, versus just reading more things on my own, maybe finding that group approach would be something helpful. And, um, you know, just since I'm doing this, I'll say a little plug for myself. Like I do have a group that meets twice a week and has a place for like private questions on our Facebook group. So there are definitely support groups out there. Um, I know curables is like a 12 week thing and some people continue meeting with their group, but there may be others that are. Well, our, our, our group kept, our group kept meeting for about 15 months after it formally ended but mm. then it kind of fell apart because mm -hmm. you know several people were sort of like well I don't want to focus on pain anymore oh yeah I'm yeah on with my life and that kind of thing yeah. and so yeah I mean it was great while it lasted yeah yeah so it sounds like um some of those elements that helped before are things that you could look for in the future like okay that's probably you know, maybe going on my own hasn't been as successful because it's hard for me to reframe some of those stressors and to get insight on them. But when I'm in a group and I have those other people, so, you know, like looking for what has helped before more of the mind body approach and the group, then like treating it physically, then you have some clues of which direction to go in the future. Let me just ask you, are there any of those things, you know, as far as other references you know when we heard that summary and you read the chapter were there any other things that you were kind of drawn to or that stood out to you or was it more kind of just overwhelming and confusing you know it, it's not confusing it's just there are a lot of different options mm -hmm. and I have a tendency to pick something and try it out for a little while and then I kind of let it go and then I go on to something else and mm -hmm. so I haven't stuck with anything consistently through the years you know mm -hmm. yeah so, so that might be something to know about yourself and just you know kind of think like well you know this kind of option might be better for me where I could commit to it for a year or something, or I um, am seeking out, like I said, more of a group than doing it on my own. But, but then the other question is that, you know, I guess this is something Alan Gordon's talked about is that some people's minds need to have something to sort of fixate on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I also wonder if my sort of choosing something like, okay, now I'm going to worry about this approach, or now I'm going to focus on improving my diet, or now I'm, you know, that just becomes my sort of fixation, my rabbit hole. I go down, I read everything I can about it. And maybe that's not all that balanced either. Yeah, I know what you're saying. And I think the complicated thing with this is that it's not the exact activity that we choose or the direction that we choose. It's how we're feeling about it. So if we're like excited by a new concept and we're really interested in reading about it and it's fun for us, we could choose something and and fixate on it in a way that is like pleasurable and fun and healthy. But when we're fixating on it with anxiety, it could be the very same thing, but we're approaching it with that urgency, with, you know, kind of this perfectionism. So definitely that's what's so, so tricky about this as approach is two people could do the exact same thing and have a different result from it because one is approaching it you know, maybe they they try tapping, for example, and they're doing tapping so much and they're expecting it to change and, and they actually prevent their healing from going faster by that urgency and anxiety and compulsion and preoccupation with it. So that's a good thing to just notice and realize in yourself. If you're approaching something with that preoccupation and anxiety even if it is a very healthy thing for you, it won't go as well as if you um, have 
you know, different emotions about it. So that's why it's so tricky, right? Okay. I I don't want to take up all your time, but one last question, you know, would be about the the issue of trying to work with somebody one-on-one versus a group. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Definitely one-on-one you address things deeper and it's more personal and you can get specific feedback for yourself. And um, as I said, there's so many options out there for groups and even for one-on-one. And I know some of those lists, like I'm on a couple of those lists, the PPDA one and the pain reprocessing one, and you'll see a variety of people and their approaches and prices and um, you know, packages and things like that. So I know that can be confusing to people and overwhelming because not everyone has the same exact, um, pricing or packaging or things like that. But that's also the nice thing is you could, you know, for me, like I said, I'm the kind of person that focuses a little more on getting you to enjoy your life more and start to not just decrease the anxiety, but increase things that are fun and playful. And, and I focus more on um, nervous system regulation than some people who might be more just like, it's all about your thoughts, you know? So, so, you know, trying to just like be open to what those differences are, but then also, a lot of times people that have anxiety or that ruminate, it's hard to make decisions. So that can be a point of starting to, you know, maybe even you do some consults with a few different people and some people will do like a, a free consult or a low priced, you know, one session so you can get a feel for them. And then maybe doing some journaling or starting to ask yourself like what feels best for me because There may be some people that you just kind of resonate more with, and that would be like the direction you want to go. But there are definitely people that do really well with one-on-one, and there are people that do really well with groups as well. So if you haven't tried one-on-one, that could, I mean, generally that's the approach that's faster and you get more individual attention and get your, you know, issues addressed a little more clearly because okay. you're all right well I really appreciate all your yeah your advice thank okay. you okay yeah I wish I had just a great like simple direct answer that was just like just do this but you know like this is how this chapter is especially where it's like you might want to just like go back through it or you might want to leave it alone and not go back through it at all and do other stuff and it's very individualized but I offer like a $49 clarity call where you could talk to me for an hour and just get some clarity for yourself on, you know, what your, your main questions are. And so I think if you look around, I mean, there are definitely some practitioners that don't do one-on-ones at all, but there are a lot of people that are, you know, maybe just starting out their practice and they offer even some, some free things or whatever. So yeah. All right. This to is... trust yourself <laughs> if you can. Okay. This is Tigger who's come to Tigger. join the conversation. Oh, cute. Hey, kitty. So cute. There you go. Nice. Okay. Well, I hope that helps. I know it wasn't yeah. like, um, yeah, I, it's hard for me to say like what's best for you. And of course, I'm a little biased because I am a coach and I've seen people do really well with the one on one. But like I said, People do really well in my group too. So some people prefer okay. group. All right. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, PJ. Trina, you have your hand up. What's on your mind? Now, is this going to uh, offer something to PJ or to the group oh, good. of some of the stuff that I've, you know, been around that was helpful along with? you know, Howard Schubert and curable stuff. And I don't remember exactly how I came to it, but um, it's called the three principles. It's mind, I think thought, mind, I don't know, mind, thought, consciousness, something like that. But it's just basically how thought works Mm -hmm. and how thinking and, and which we touch on a lot with Howard Schubert, but it's more of a understanding the system 
-hmm. and then realizing like, and, and I'll just give you a quick example. Like I've taken up some art things that I do and I can sit here and do my art for four hours and, and like never thought of the pain in those four hours. Mm -hmm. And it's like, where did it go? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's only there when we're conscious and thinking of it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and so there's a girl named Hannah Studley who is British, but she lives in Israel and she does a lot of stuff on uh, the three principles and pain. Cause she had incredibly chronic pain for a very long time. And, and now she's pain free. And we actually did a, a, like a seminar at my house, like two summers ago, she came from Israel, but um it's just, it's just another thing. There's, if I was, I was also involved. There's a lady named Amy Johnson who does a podcast called Changeable. Mm -hmm. And she had a pain group where there were, I think, four ladies. And I was one of them who had chronic pain from all over the world. And we had like a, I don't remember if it was an eight week course or something. And it's on her website. And you know, we just all, you know, looked at our pain through the three principles of the mind, thought, and consciousness, and um, just how much your thought and your overthinking about it can really, you know, obviously magnify it, just like we're talking about here. But they, it's a slightly different approach, and it's about your. I also through that found this guy. Um, I don't, I don't remember his name, um, but he has a book called, oh, <laughs> let me just, I have it really quick. I have such a bad memory. Um, it's called No Self, No Problem by mm. Chris Neubauer. And he talks about left brain, right brain. Mm -hmm. And obviously our pain is coming from our left side of our brain mm -hmm. and our right side is ba basically like, you're always whole. You're always okay you're you know what I mean it's like yeah. your sense of self mm -hmm. um so I don't know I've just find found some other stuff that's not always just in this yeah this venue you know what I mean like yeah. some stuff that's on the margins that have helped along with this yeah so that's all I had to say okay <laughs> yeah thanks Trina yeah yeah it's it's nice to um just hear about those different options. And again, if you're feeling kind of drawn to it, you're like, oh, I'm curious about this. Oh, this is, this sounds like a route I want to go. Like starting to trust yourself. And, and one of the things I actually teach is that as you get more regulated with your nervous system, you do become more intuitive. And I even have a, um, one of my modules is about decision-making with intuition, because most of the time it's hard for most of us to make decisions, you know, there's so much information we can go back and forth. And that is one of those nervous system states of, you know, maybe trying to make the perfect decision and trying to, um, you know, do, just do what's right. And those personality traits we talk about. So this starts to be a process of, you know, starting to trust yourself and trust your, your gut and, and that's the way I think about it because otherwise I just get so overwhelmed with everything and my brain can argue with itself for hours or days if I let it and starting to trust myself has been one of the nice things about doing this mind body work is to, you know, start to realize like, I do know what's best for me deep down. Sometimes it takes, you know, some time for me to realize it, but um, especially if you're just really in that place of like, there's just so much and I can't figure it out. Um, start to notice how you're feeling when you're listening to these things or when you're, you know, talking with someone. And if you're, you know, starting to feel more calm or regulated or peaceful or you're you're drawn to it, maybe try trusting yourself on that. And um, you can also tell sometimes, like I tell people, like if it really stresses out your nervous system to think about the money that is involved, then maybe that isn't the right option for you. Cause you know, if, if you're like, I had one, one woman who she committed to doing one-on-one -on -one 
um, coaching with me, but she just was this very frugal person who hadn't really spent money on herself. And she thought money should, you know, be spent on other people, not herself. And it was really hard for her um, to, to, she made a lot of progress, but she still had this kind of sense of like, I shouldn't be spending this money on myself. And it was, it was stressful to her to do that. So there's so many options out there and, and maybe just starting to trust that you'll be led to the the next best step for you. And there may be another step after that and another step after that. Okay, any other questions, comments? Things to share about what's worked for you, what you've liked? Um, someone's asking, do I do IBS coaching so much better after using every resource available plus meditation, journaling, Nerva, you name it, but I need to slowly add more food to my diet as I become less fearful of intolerances. Yes. Um, IBS is something I've personally dealt with and a lot of people that I've worked with have had digestive issues and we work on adding things back in a safe way. And so I can like personally <laughs> say I've gone through that and um, definitely have coached people on that as well. And IBS is a nice one because um, it's, it's pretty clear cut that it has a huge, if not complete mind body component. So, you know, starting, like I said, for me, starting to see my symptoms, even if it's like bloating or, you know, whatever pain as stress related rather than food related has given me so much more freedom. And I even just announced to my group for the first time was able to eat some raw broccoli that I just had avoided for years because I had such a bad reaction to raw broccoli years ago that even when I found out about this approach and tried some kind of half cooked broccoli, I still had some pretty bad symptoms. And so for me, it wasn't something that I, you know, worked on every day because raw broccoli wasn't something that I was like feeling super um, passionate about eating. But just the other day I was cooking some broccoli and I thought I'm going to just try some raw broccoli and I was able to eat it without symptoms. So it's totally possible for you guys for sure. And especially if the um, resources that you've tried, like meditation and journaling and that Nerva app, if those have been working for you, that's a good sign that you're on the right track. But it can be scary to start to add more food. So just being really compassionate with yourself on that and knowing that if you do get some symptoms, like it doesn't mean you've done it wrong and it doesn't mean this won't work for you. And then I keep telling myself it's not the food, but my brain. However, there are intolerances. Yeah. So definitely that can be one of those tricky areas where, you know, you might decide like, okay, this, you know, this one food I'm willing to live without because I don't really care about raw broccoli that much. Or it might be a food like for me, I really wanted to get back to drinking coffee because I just like the smell of it and the taste of it and that routine of it in the morning. So that was something I was able to work on. And I used to, you know, think, oh, I need this acid reducer. And I used to buy these expensive things to put in my coffee. And then now I can drink it just fine and have zero symptoms. So totally normal that your brain will, um, you know, be on high alert. So some of it is just working through when those symptoms come up, reacting to them differently so that the brain doesn't produce them as much in the future, but definitely taking that graded exposure approach. So you're not just like, let me eat all the foods at once. You know, it's just like very small amounts, um, maybe even visualizing before you do it. That can be super helpful. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah, that's a, that's a good one for me. I feel like I can give advice on that one for sure. Okay, we may be quiet today, but no, we are listening. Thank you. All right, Susan. I know, I think um, sometimes like this happens in my coaching group too, where people are so like, um, so sweet and so kind, right? This is kind of our personality traits of, of people with mind-body syndrome is like, you know, I don't want to like take time away from other people. And I just want to, you know, 
just kind of be respectful and be really nice and and be the perfect student and not, you know, say anything or so I, I totally get it. I'm the same way on a lot of calls too. I'm like, ah, uh, I like listening, but I don't want to be the one, you know, to bring up something. So I totally get it. And I'm personally just trying to get more comfortable with these awkward silences and eventually someone will say something. <laughs> But we do have a few more minutes. So if you've been waiting, this is your this is your chance. We can learn a lot from each other. Yeah, for sure. That's what I like about groups. Um, sometimes my one-on-one -on -one clients, I'm like, I wish they were in a group so they could talk to this other person going through that very same thing. So, you know, there's there's pros and cons to both. And sometimes I'll even offer like for my one-on-one -on -one clients that they can have free access to the group too, so that they get the group support as well as diving deeper into their one-on-one. -on -one. And, and also in my group, you can buy a one-on-one -on -one each month for a hundred dollars, which is a discounted rate. And um, so sometimes I like to do kind of a hybrid where you can have the best of both worlds. But yeah, if you've been going it alone or, um, you know, struggling and, and just even want some clarity or um, someone's opinion or you want to try out a group, definitely let me know. And um, I'm happy to help you. And if you feel like we're not a good fit, that's totally fine. There's other people, too. So um, and how is my coaching accessed? I think you're talking about like through Zoom. Um but I could put on there the link for my clarity call. That might be, I would think a good place for you to start is just, um, you know, just kind of like booking an hour with me where we can talk over things and get some clarity on kind of how you want to proceed. And maybe just getting some ideas of what you want to work on on your own, or maybe, you know, it's it's time for you to, invest and that's great too i'm happy to support you on that so i just sent that link there and my website is bodyandmindlifecoach.com i can put that there too and then remember we have one more week um i'm post oops i think i did a typo though there <laughs> we have next week is the Q&A, frequently asked questions. And then I think, I'm trying to multitask. I think that I want to do another book club on unlearn your anxiety and depression. Because honestly, anxiety is something that I personally have struggled with and coach on so much. And it's just like, you know, kind of really enmeshed with, with chronic pain type symptoms. Like pain goes down, anxiety goes up. And so it's nice to know that we can address it those same ways. But yeah, please let me know if you have any other questions and we will just meet once again next week. And thanks you guys for joining. We'll see you next week and you can catch the replays on my email list or on my YouTube channel. All right, take care guys, bye.